Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for being here this evening for WSHU's Join the Conversation. And this evening, we are so excited to have one of my very favorite storytellers is Stacey Vanek Smith. I am going to fangirl quickly to let you know how much I have enjoyed this book. And we are so thrilled to have Stacy here. But before we get started, just a couple of logistical things. Um, now that we are, uh, using the Zoom platform, um, we have uh, closed captioning available to you. And so feel free to turn the closed captioning on or off. And if you want to see who is speaking, you can also turn on the live transcript uh, icon on the bottom of your screen. We've been collecting several uh, questions through Harkin, our Harkin platform from all of you in the audience. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for this evening is the Fairfield Public Library. Now, the WSHU Join the Conversation series puts together speakers from across um, the continent um, and puts them in touch with our public radio listeners right here in Connecticut and Long Island for fascinating, thought-provoking discussions. Over the years, we've had conversations with several authors, including Mark Bittman, Joyce Carol Oates, Anna Quinlan, and most recently, Chang Julie Wong um, and her book that we featured, A Beautiful Country. So, to go on to introductions for this evening, I'd first like to give you a little bit of background on Desiree Diorio from our WSHU newsroom, who will be interviewing Stacey Vanek Smith this morning. Desiree is from Connecticut, but now calls Long Island her home. She's been with us since 2019. And this past year, she's joined the American Homefront Project, representing us nationally with her telling stories on veterans and military affairs. Okay, now on to Stacey Vanek Smith. I already told you guys I'm a huge fan. So it is absolutely my honor and privilege to introduce her to you. Stacey Vanek Smith uh, works for NPR. She is a co host for um, The Indicator, and she also is a correspondent for Planet Money, where she covers business and economics. Now, prior to NPR, Stacey worked for Marketplace. We're big fans of Marketplace here as well. Now, as I mentioned, not only is Stacey a phenomenal storyteller, but she's a dogged reporter, having followed economic stories down the muddy back roads of Oklahoma to buy 100 barrels of oil. She's traveled through India to track down the man who pitched the country's dynamic currency devaluation to the prime minister. I heard that episode. I love that episode. And she's also spoken to a North Korean woman who has made a full, small fortune smuggling artificial sweetener in from China. Well, it is my pleasure to welcome both WSHU's Desiree Diorio. Hello, Desiree. And Hello. I will let Desiree uh, introduce and bring up Stacey Vanek Smith. So excited for the conversation tonight. Thank you, Des, and thank you, Stacey. Hi, thanks, Rima. Um, Stacy, thank you so much for being here and congratulations on the book. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here and very excited for this conversation. And thank you. Thank you very much. It's timely. We've been needing a book like this and you lay out exactly what the obstacles are for women in the workplace and how we can navigate those obstacles. But your sense of humor still comes through, thankfully, because some of these topics would be downright painful without your <laughs> well-timed levity. So really well done. Let's get right into it. When I first saw the title of the book, Machiavelli for Women, Defend Your Worth, Grow Your Ambition, Win the Workplace, I was a little wary. The popular perception of Machiavelli is he was, you know, unethical, deceptive, uh, cutthroat. Psychologists actually use Machiavelli's name to describe personality traits. And I'm like, I don't want to be like that guy. Can you talk about who Machiave Machiavelli was and the prince and what you saw in there that inspired you to write the book? Yes, you're absolutely right. Machiavelli does not have a reputation for being um, particularly woke. Uh, also, you're, you're right, he has a reputation for being kind of um, 
back channel-y, deceptive, manipulative, the ends justify the means, which he didn't actually say. Um, but, and you're, and there is actually a psychological disorder, part of the dark triad of psychopathy and narcissism is Machiavellianism, characterized by like basically a pathological liar. Um, but the reason that I went with Machiavelli, actually Machiavelli came second. So the, the reason that I wanted to write the book was, so I've been covering business and economics for, for more than 15 years now. And you end up doing the, sometimes the sort of the same stories multiple times over, over the course of a career. And one of the stories that I'd done a bunch of times was the gender pay gap. And I was reporting on it a few years ago, four years ago, and I was talking to uh, Dr. Francine Blau. She's a, a wonderful economist who's done great work on, on the gender pay gap. And she just tossed off this thing, you know, as I was talking with her about it, she's like, well, you know, this stuff hasn't changed in 20 years. And I was like, it hasn't changed in 20 years. And she's like, well, it's changed a little. She's like, it really hasn't changed in 10. And so the gender pay gap is women earn about 80 cents on the dollar uh, compared to men. For Black women, it's 63 cents. For Latino women, it's 55 cents. Um, I mean, and those numbers have basically been frozen for 10 years. I mean, and if you think about how much our economy has changed over 10 years, over 20 years, as far as, you know, the different industries that have come up. And, you know, also I knew that women were going to law school and medical school in much higher numbers and breaking into new fields all the time. And just the fact that this was frozen was very strange to me. And then I did a story pretty shortly after that on the CEO gap. So CEOs are 80% male and 90% white. And those numbers had also not changed in 10 years. And it's the numbers are even wider and even more male for a Fortune 500 companies. Basically, the more money a company has, the wider and more male its, its management is. This also made no sense to me. I'm like, but the, you know, it's Silicon Valley. They're disrupting everything and they don't wear suits anymore. And it's all about ideas and merit. And how is this still happening? So this was sort of troubling me. And I, I wanted to, to write a book about this. I thought like I wanted to understand what was going on, why this data was stuck when the American economy has been so dynamic over the last 20 years. So much stuff has changed. It's been such an amazing force, you know, to, to report on this and just how much it's grown and changed and transformed and why this is stuck. And I was talking to my editor about it, this woman, Karen Marcus at Simon & Schuster, she's wonderful. And she said, you know, it's almost like women need Machiavelli. And that really got me thinking. I had read Machiavelli in college, really hated Machiavelli. I thought it was just like, I don't, I'm not interested in power or like killing people or lands or I'm not one of those people who loves like, my dad really loves the history of like generals and I don't really like that. So I was, but I was sort of intrigued. So I bought a copy of The Prince. It's very short. It's only like 50 pages long. And I started reading it in this coffee shop. This is back before, when could still go to coffee shops. Uh, and um, I started reading and the first thing that Machiavelli opens with is this apology, this very weird sort of bowing and scraping to Lorenzo de' Medici. He's like, dear Lorenzo de' Medici, like probably isn't even worth your time. I can't believe you'd even take time out of your day to read this. I mean, this is Machiavelli, right? Mr. Bravado. And this is how he starts his book about power is sort of this weird apology. I had no idea why. I found out later. Um, and then the book itself was what really sold me on this. Um, I started reading and in the very beginning, he's like, there are two kinds of princes. There's the inheriting prince and the conquering prince. The inheriting prince has inherited position and title. Things are pretty cushy. He's the status quo. People are used to him. They expect him to have power. He's a pretty stable position. The conquering prince is in a much different position. He's new to power, probably had to kill a lot of people to get where he is. Everybody's questioning him. There's a lot of resentment. People are kind of trying to destabilize him. They're like, why is he in power? Why am I not in power? And I was like, you know, that that's a lot like women and like traditionally marginalized people in the workforce. And and then from there, like just Machiavelli's advice, it was very different than I thought. It was, I had misjudged him in college, I think. Um, it wasn't just about power and take, I mean, it, it, it is about power and taking over things, but um, it was so smart and he was so, so analytical. He just removed emotion from everything. And I found it to be so helpful. And I thought it was an approach that 
at least for me, was like a breath of fresh air almost. One of the first things that you talk about in the book is how important it is for women to face the fact that gender discrimination in the workplace is a real thing and it does exist. And you talk about the ways that we try to paper over that, push it down, assume that we just have to try harder. But talk about why it's so important for women to recognize that the discrimination is a real thing and it's happening. And, and why is it so hard for women to come to grips with that? This was one of the most interesting parts of the book for me, um, both in terms of the research. I mean, you mentioned that like a lot of the book, there are like parts that are really troubling and kind of depressing. And I completely agree. A lot of the data is really depressing. I mean, there's the, gen the gender pay gap data, but like a lot of the data around when women have children, I think we've seen a lot of that during the pandemic. Women just get like a lot of marginalized and, and there's a lot of discrimination against mothers as well. So I was reading this and I spoke with this woman, uh, Dr. Stephanie K. Johnson. She studies harassment, she actually studies harassment at the University of Colorado Boulder. And she said to me that there's a lot of denial around discrimination. It's one of the first conversations that I had. And I was like, well, why is that? It didn't make sense to me. I was like, why is that? And she's like, well, people, she's like, it's so disempowering to admit that there's discrimination. Because she said, you know, if it's if the reason you're not getting, it's, I mean, if people usually don't say, well, listen, you know, I'd love to promote you, but you're a woman and I'm a misogynist, so it's not going to happen. It's normally like, and I don't think that's what happened in most people's heads, right? It's, it's much subtler than that. People are like, I don't know. It just seems like Frank's a little more ready than Francine. And just, I have a, a better gut feeling about him. It's, it's there that the discrimination comes into play. And if you are on the receiving end of discrimination of any kind, I think, to say like, oh, I just need to work a little harder. I just need to improve this or that. That's something you can control, you know? And that, that can feel empowering. Whereas saying like, yeah, this guy's never gonna promote me because he doesn't like putting women in management positions. It's like, what do you do with that? So it can feel empowering to deny discrimination. It's really, there's something really disheartening about admitting that there's a problem that it, and it's about an aspect of yourself you have no control over right it's like yeah. okay well what am i supposed to do <laughs> um but machiavelli is very big on seeing the situation you're in clearly and that can be empowering it doesn't feel empowering at first and i think that's why there's a tendency to deny discrimination and also you know at least my personal experience i don't want to be thinking every single thing is discrimination. I feel like there's that, that sort of temptation to be like, well, you know, you, you don't want to discount, you don't want to take your personal responsibility out of it or say like, well, maybe my work wasn't up to snuff or maybe he, he should be earning a little more than me. It, feel, it feels like I'm passing the buck. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't want to not take responsibility for the part that's yours. Um, I, you know, and, and so I think, it can feel empowering to not think something is discrimination, but you're not, if you're, if you're able to, to see the situation clearly, Machiavelli, that was his biggest thing. He thought princes, a lot of princes had lost kingdoms because they, the situation changed and they wouldn't look at, at the change, at how their situation had changed and they wouldn't admit it. So it can actually be empowering, I think, to see the problem for what it is, be like, okay, uh, I have a boss who does not seem to like promoting women into management positions. First of all, then you're not running yourself in circles, trying to make your work better when that's not really the issue. You can address the issue directly because you're looking at it directly. So it's like, okay, what should I do? Um, Neha Narkede is one of the people I interviewed for the book. I really, she had the simplest and just the smartest approach to this. Um, she was a founder of a, a unicorn company in Silicon Valley called Confluent. Uh, before that, she worked away at the chain at LinkedIn. And she said what she would do, she said she encountered this in tech all the time. And she said she saw women just leaving in droves for, for, for this reason, because they felt like they didn't have a shot. 
at getting sort of the jobs they wanted to get. So she said she would go to her boss and say, okay, I'd really love to be whatever, senior, like senior manager. And, you know, her supervisor said, no, no, I'm, you're not ready for that. It's like, okay, great. Well, it's what I would love to do. What do you need to see from me to get there? Like, what, what would you need to see very specifically? Well, I need to see your production go up by 20% and I need to see you leading a team. Great. How would, how would you want to see me leading a team? What would that entail? Very, very detailed notes. Then she would go do all the things on the list and then come back to them. And that was such a smart way around discrimination, a lot of which I think, most of which I think is unintentional because then it's like, oh, well, I guess, I don't know. Those are the stipulations I laid out. She met all of them. It takes it away from the, I just don't know if she's management material realm and into like a very concrete realm. So- uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 that's all, I'm done. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned Neha because one of the things that you were talking about um, with her was how she takes that feedback and she specifically goes and seeks it out so to make that list to prove that she's accomplished the things that she was told were go going to get her into that upper position. Um, and it seems to me going to ask for feedback when I've already been told, no, you're not getting the position, I think you called it masochistic. And I was like, that's exactly right. But but how do we overcome that impulse? What can we do to, to get ourselves over that hump so that we can ask those questions and create that accountability with where we're trying to go? Yes. I mean, asking for feedback is, it's like my nightmare. Like, I don't want to ask for feedback. I just want to be like told that I'm doing a great job. But her approach was so refreshing because she was like, she said what she would do, she would always ask for more than she thought she could get. She just sort of wanted to be told no so that she could be like, okay, great. Well, what do I have to do? What do you have to see for me? So she'd get all of these specifics and she said she would get feedback too. So that way, like, let's say, let's say my manager actually is interested in promoting me, but doesn't think I work very well with other people that could come up. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's something that I could work on and get where I want to go. So it's a diagnostic question. And so if you can kind of approach it as, great, what are the things standing between me and this thing that I want, whether it's a raise or a promotion or like leading a project, what are the things, and this is the person who is like the little gatekeeper. So you ask the gatekeeper, like, how do I get through this gate? tell me, give me the prescription. And it is, and the way she talked about it, it seems sort of exciting and liberating. Like, oh yeah, just ask. Like, great, here's what I want to do. What do I have to do to get it? It sounds so simple. I ne it never occurred to me to just ask. I mean, I'm just like, well, what about like the stewing? Like I like to, I, I prefer to stew. Um, but I loved that approach. It was very, she just approached it like it's a collaboration. Like, here's where I want to go. What would you need to see from me for me to get there? I love right. that. Yeah. As women, we're so often in these positions where we're damned if we're too feminine because of the stereotypes that come with that. But we're also damned if we're too masculine because of the stereotypes that come with that. And in the book, you talk about balancing a little bit of both. And sometimes that means altering your speech or altering your clothing. And I'll be honest, when, when I read it, I kind of, I sort of bristled at that because I didn't want to do it. I don't want to have to change myself. And then I realized I actually do do it. When I'm reading an email, I'm, I'm looking for things that might get taken to be too abrasive or uh, too authoritative. Were there things as you were putting the book together and all of these different ideas, were there things that it made you uncomfortable to recommend or, or, or tell me, tell me about that process, about how these tips, and if there was any that made you feel like a little icky? So many of them made me feel icky. Yes, is the short answer. Yeah. I mean, some of the, what I realized, I actually spoke with, there's a wonderful gender researcher, Joan C. Williams, uh, who I talked to a lot for the book. And she wrote a wonderful book called What Works for Women at Work. And I, I mentioned to her at one point, I was like, you know, some of this advice is just like, I don't really want to give it. And she's like, well, you know, exactly. She's like, you know, what works for women at work 
is you know, she was talking about her book. She's like, what should work for women at work is a completely different book. Like we shouldn't have to deal with a lot of this stuff. We shouldn't have to deal with it, but we are dealing with it. We do. We're dealing with the realities of misogyny and discrimination. You have to work with that in some way. And so I was determined to look at the problem, look at the research and offer as many solutions as I could, because a lot of times these situations can feel sort of airless, like there's nothing you can do that helplessness. So I wanted to give people options. Some of the options I really hated to give, you know, I didn't, I didn't love it. I mean, what you're talking about that women experience, um, and a lot of people have asked me like, well, can men read this book too? And of, of course I said, absolutely, yes. Um, the workplace is hard for everyone. Um, one of the things that can be uniquely hard for women and, and a lot of marginalized workers, people of color to experience this is there's this like, it's what's called in the case of women, the double bind researchers call it. Uh, and what that is, is like you said, there are these sort of archetypal expectations we have of women and of leaders. And our archetypal expectations, and these are unconscious expectations uh, of women are that, you know, nurturing, modest, um, behind the scenes, doesn't want to grab credit, supportive, like kind. And those are great qualities. The problem is our archetypal expectations of a leader are assertive, outspoken, doesn't care too much what other people think, action oriented. And so when women get into mid career and beyond, when they start to take on leadership positions, if women display a lot of sort of archetypally feminine qualities, uh, people will really like them and, and think they're like a good person, but they will not promote them. And if women display a lot of leadership qualities, uh, so sort of the more archetypally leadership qualities, people will often really not like them, even if they do get leadership qualities. I feel like female politicians get the fallout from this a lot. So basically you end up in a situation that feels impossible. And so like with the ways through it, I think one of the things you're talking about, um, Joan Williams said she was a, in academic law and she said she was, she sends, she said she brings a lot of masculine energy to work. She's very assertive and she speaks up and she said it was just a, a disaster. Like she wasn't getting along well with her colleagues. So she on accident started wearing dresses more often because her daughter, her young daughter was going through this like dresses only phase, like two year old daughter. So she started wearing dresses and she said she noticed that just because of that, the men in her office started being kinder to her and that like having a more positive response. And that's when she came up with the, this idea, she calls it gender judo. But if just sort of looking at, you know, what aspect of your personality you're bringing to different parts of your job, I mean, does this mean you should wear dresses more? Of course, it does not mean that. But, you know, just to sort of examine places where you're leading with feminine energy, archetypally feminine energy versus archetypal leadership energy. And to, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky thing to navigate for sure. But, yeah. but that was the, the root of that. Yeah. And I mean, you didn't write this for policymakers. You didn't write this for politicians. You wrote this for everyday women who are going to work and trying to figure out where they stand in this workplace. So, okay, my point being like the reality in the workplace is the reality that we have to deal with. So let's, it, it's sort of like, let's work with what we've been given and this is how we're gonna go forward. And here's an idea of how to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the ways that I started to think about it was sort of short-term goals versus long-term goals. Like, what is your ultimate goal and is what you're doing in the moment reaching your ultimate goal? So let's say you find out that your boss is paying you $20,000 less than your male colleague who has less experience and is always calling in sick. So, you know, I mean, you could go into the office and be like, I can't believe you're doing this. This is so unfair. How could you let this happen? And that's true. Like, that is a valid and, like, correct response to right. being underpaid like that. But if your long-term goal is to, it's like, okay, what do I actually want out of this situation? And this is where Machiavelli really comes in. He was all about sort of long-term strategies, removing emotion from, and, and incidentally morality from situations and just looking at things like a chessboard. So it's like, okay, I know that my coworker Ralph is making $20,000 more than I am. I know he has less experience. So there's $20,000 on the table here. Um, I have a lot of leverage in this moment, that leverage being knowledge. 
how do I want to play this? What are my goals in this workplace? Like, well, I really want this promotion. Maybe I can go in and this can be a starting point to a conversation. So you go in a little differently. Or, you know, let's say you're not getting along well with your team. You're like, okay, well, my goal is to lead this team and to have a happy functional team. So like maybe if I change the way that I email, I open with more niceties, maybe that will garner the response that I want to get to the place where I wanna go. Um, but you're right, a lot of the advice was really uncomfortable, um, but I was committed. I kept coming back to the original data that I started the book with, the pay gap and the promotion gap. And I was like, I, I do not wanna give advice that's not helpful. I mean, I did find out at one point that a male coworker was making a whole lot more than I was who had less experience. And what did I do? I went into my boss's office and kind of yelled and cried. Like that is what I did. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but that's what I did. You know, I went into his office and I sort of yelled and cried and I did get a raise uh, as a result of that. But I really wish I'd handled it differently. Like it wasn't right. that it was not a valid response. Like, of course it was a valid response. I never should have been in that situation in the first place. And right. Uh, and it, it, that was a very minor example of the kinds of things people experience at work. But the question is, what's your ultimate goal? Um, you know, is your ultimate goal? My ultimate goal was not really, I mean, the money was part of it, but I really wish I had thought more carefully about how to use that. Um, so that's kind of what I tried to emphasize in the book. Just a few weeks ago, you were talking on Planet Money about how much anger and how much rage people who work in the customer service industry have been experiencing. Um, and, and in the book, a lot of the women that you're talking to are professionals. Do you think these strategies in the book, are they transferable to these customer service jobs as well? If you were talking to a, a flight attendant or a retail worker, would you tweak any of this advice or, or does it stand? I mean, I think, sorry, I've got a little siren going by. It's New York. Uh, of course. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of it is the same, right? I mean, I think what happens in a lot of work situations, especially if you're experiencing discrimination or unfairness or exclusion and sort of experiencing it, like it's, it's the initial, like the emotional response often that you have to manage or at least examine. And I think that's what happens in a lot of these cases with customer service, right? Someone gets so frustrated and they lose it. Um, and so how do you handle that? I mean, I feel like it is sort of the same thing. You know, it's like, should you have to be dealing with someone who's losing it and screaming at you? No, but they are right, there they are, losing it and screaming at you. So what do you wanna do? What is your ultimate goal with this person? I mean, do you have every right to like yell back? Yes, <laughs> they're yelling at you for no reason. Yes, you do. Uh, but that might not elicit the response that you want. So a lot of it's about, I mean, and I think the thing that I really appreciated about Machiavelli was he just removed all emotion and, and morality from situations. I think actually the reason he's so scandalous and the reason he, his advice is so timeless is the same, which is that everything's analytical. It's like a chessboard. So it makes his advice very timeless and he has a lot of wisdom and insight. It also like makes for some very chilling advice. Like, you know, if someone, if you wrong someone, you should probably like kill them and their family so they don't come after you later. Um, which is, you know, sound. 500 years later, that's, that won't work anymore. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's still done, you know, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but, but, you know, I do think there's a lot to be said for, you know, we're not robots. Like our emotions are there for a reason. Anger is there for a reason. It's telling you something. It's giving you a boost of energy. It's saying, this isn't right. I'm not happy here. I think that you can use that discomfort. I think you want to make sure that it's working for you as much as possible and not against you. Um, and I think it's very hard to do. It's easy to say, and it's hard to do. It's like, well, don't be angry. That's not helpful. It's like, yes, it's not helpful. And I am still angry. You know, I always say, well, it doesn't, it's not going to do you any good to be mad. It's like, yeah, that's not really, I'm not mad because I thought it would be useful. I just feel mad. Um, but I do think as much as possible to sort of let the emotional 
wave kind of go over you and then be like, okay, what do I want? How, like, what is like, what position am I in? How do I get where I want to go? Um, and that's easier said than done, especially when it comes to being discriminated against or unfair treatment. But I think it is, you know, it gives you some options, which I think can be really helpful. It, would you say that's your top line takeaway that you want people to get from the book? Just just stay goal oriented and make sure you've got your eyes on what your long term goals is. Or, or what would you say you, you, you want people to take from the book? Now, oh, that's a great question. I think I want people to feel like there's some air in the room. Like I want people to feel like they have choices. Um, I think so much of the the bad effects of of a lot of like unfair workplace behavior and discrimination is that it can take your choices away. It takes your freedom away. It takes, I mean, having less money takes choices away. It takes freedom away. I want to give as much of that back as possible. Um, and I want to carve out a space or give people the ability to, to have some space carved out to be able to make the decisions that they're going to feel good about later. Like, do I feel good about the fact I cried in my boss's office? I don't. I wish I had not done that. Um, I don't feel great about that, that decision later. I mean, it was fine. But, you know, I want, I want to give people the tools that I guess I wish I had had myself, but to like, to, to sort of be able to move forward in their careers um, and, and have, feel as empowered and as, um, like, as sort of masters of their own fates as possible. Um, we're going to get some questions from our audience. Um, we've got a couple that we already received through Harkin. In the meantime, if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to use that Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, first, we have Elise Paris, who wants to know, what is the major thing that will help women make strides for equality in our patriarchal world? Thank you, Elise. I think, I mean, it's a little, I would say that I have two answers to that. One is sort of like a policy answer and one is sort of a personal answer. Um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was that after all, like when I would read studies, they would always have policy recommendations at the end or like recommendations for companies. And I was always like, well, what if you're just you, you know, what yeah. if you, you can't the rest change of us. policy right away, right? What about for the rest of us? Um, for policymakers, I think childcare and for companies, I think childcare is probably the big one. Um, Claudia Golden uh, is an amazing economist. She has a lot of work out about this, but, but childcare is probably the biggest single factor in a lot of this stuff probably including the pay gap. Women will often work part-time instead of full-time to accommodate childcare. They'll pick professions or jobs within professions that can accommodate that. And it, it this is probably the single biggest factor in, um, sh in shaping women's approach toward work. And so for women to have sort of maximum freedom around childcare, I think is probably the biggest game changer that we could have. Uh, on a personal level, the most important thing women could do I would say is, I mean, I would say it's probably what um, Neha Narkede said. That to me, that was sort of the most empowering sort of practical advice for the workplace is to like figure out where you wanna go, ask how to get there and, you know, and navigate the way there. She did say, I should add that sometimes she's like 80% of the time that would work. 20% of the time her manager would, she would go back to her manager being like, I did all the things on the list and he would just give her another list or, you know, be like, well, I don't know. And then she said she knew that's when she needed to leave. Um, it just like, wasn't worth her time to stay there. It was, it's interesting you bring up the childcare as your first thing, because that was one of the mind blown moments for me when I was reading the book and I had to read it again. You wrote about how the pay gap between mothers and women without children is roughly the same as the gender pay gap. And I was just like, that's um, really troubling. It's, I mean, it's probably the, one of the trickiest kinds of discrimination to deal with for a bunch of reasons. It's like much less studied and, um, 
but it's, you know, as far as like women's work is viewed more critically, they tend to be like mommy tracked. They earn less money, all of this, because, because the, the assumption is like, well, you're not really serious about your job. Now you're doing your, your real job, which is caretaking. I mean, to say nothing of which a lot of women are raising children on their own and do not have a like a, a partner supporting them financially um yeah i would say that that is probably some of the the trickiest um situations for women come around child care because there is the discrimination and it often comes under the guise of people wanting to be helpful right so people will say you know listen like we shouldn't put you know janice on that assignment it's so intense she has a new baby I don't think they would do that if it were necessarily or be as likely to do it if it were a, a man with a new baby. Right. We um, don't see that paternalism for men with kids. Right. And it, but I think it's under the guise of, of trying to look out for someone right. or be thoughtful. And I think that's also what makes it tricky is it's often under the guise of like, oh, well, you shouldn't have to do this. You're dealing with this huge life event. Like you should do that. But the effects of it are really insidious and women, ret I mean, like the numbers get, like women retire with, I think a third the savings men have, way more likely to live in poverty. So many women are raising children on their own. You know, it, it, the stakes are really high for sure. Yeah. Christine wants to know, any special words of wisdom for a 50-ish old woman in the workplace who wants to not be counted out as too old or irrelevant? Bonus if you can address job searching after being reorganized out of a job from the COVID recession. Well, first of all, I, I mean, 50 is not young. It, 50 something is is young in the workforce. Um, I think a lot of sort of antiquated ideas about age and ability are have are going out the window right now. And what I would say is, as far as the job search question, this is an amazing moment to look for jobs. I mean, the really wonderful thing about being mid-career or like mid to later career is that you have experience. And right now, I have never seen a moment when workers have as much power as they do now. Employers are really desperate to hire. Everybody's jumping jobs. Um, workplaces need people. They really need experienced people. And because of a lot of the working from home uh, that a lot of people have done and a lot of companies have arranged because of COVID, flexible work situations are a lot more possible. So it sort of opens up your job search. You can now look for jobs, not just in your immediate vicinity, but a lot of jobs are just open geographically now, which completely changes the game in terms of the jobs you can look for. Services like LinkedIn and Indeed and Glassdoor and, um, and, and other online sites, you can basically get your resume out to a lot of people and you can find people and connect with them who are in your field and you know, ask them questions and kind of make those more personal connections, I think more easily too. But I would say, I mean, if you are in your fifties and you're working, like you are a very hot commodity. Um, you've got skills and experience and oh my God, employers are desperate for people to, I mean, a lot of people took early retirement because of COVID and have left the workforce and employers are desperately trying to get them back. I mean, one of the things that you brought up in the book about the importance of networking, one of uh, one of the other benefits of networking, not just being able to find those opportunities that might be out there that you might be a good fit with, but also to find out from that network, how what is the pay range for this position with this amount of experience? And, and that's a, I think that's another important part of the networking that you were talking about. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the single most important thing, and I think anyone who knows anything about negotiation would agree with me on this, the single most important thing you can have walking into a negotiation is knowledge. Um, it just changes the game in every way. This is, it, uh, I mean, I, in the, the great book, uh, Negotiation Genius, I believe, um, they make the point that if you walk into a, a negotiation with a lot of knowledge, people are just less likely to try to mess with you. You just carry yourself differently. You just, you know things and you're sort of radiating knowledge. Um, one of the biggest things is the salary range. So if you're going to go in and ask for a raise, it's so helpful to know how much other people in your job are getting paid, both at the company and at other companies. So you can say something like, well, 
you know, listen, I've done a lot of market research and I know what this company pays for this job it tends to be between 60 and $80,000. I know I'm getting 60, which I think was appropriate when I started, but I've been doing X, Y, and Z work. So now I feel like it's more appropriate for me to be paid in the $80,000 range. Um, you know, I know that's a fair market price based on the research that I've done. So how do you get that information, right? Everyone wants to walk into a, to a negotiation knowing a bunch of stuff, but you can just reach out to people. People are very understanding. Just be like, hey, I'm about to go into a salary negotiation. I think I might be underpaid, but I don't know. Like, would you mind telling me? And my favorite thing, I've talked to people about money for many years. Um, the word range is like a superpower. So if you say like, hey, how much do you make? That is just a hard question to ask. People will flinch. If you say like, do you mind telling me like, what is the salary range for your job? Do you know? Um, they're way more likely to tell you. And a friend of mine says she, start, she started reaching out to people on LinkedIn to get more salary information. She said she reaches out to white men on LinkedIn and basically says, hey, listen, I'm a woman. I'm not, I think there might be a gender pay gap issue at my company. I'm trying to ask for a raise, trying to do some research. Would you mind telling me how much you make? She said she gets an 80% response rate. She's that's very from people. That's from like cold messaging people Stranger. on LinkedIn or people she was already connected with. I think it's cold messaging on LinkedIn. Wow. Yeah, that's people amazing. Just, yeah, she said all these people have like gone a step further and been like, I asked like three of my friends and this is how much they make. And she said people seem, she was like floored. She's like, people really want to help. Um, they really want to feel like they're helping. She said they got really excited and she made all these connections, um, which I was very excited to hear. I mean, the worst anyone can say is no, I suppose. <laughs> so yeah. why not ask people outside your own network? Um, Okay, so this next question comes from Anonymous. I have a colleague who insists that white women don't face discrimination. Our immediate supervisor and the head of our organization are both white women, a point he likes to make. I lie awake arguing with him in my head. Give me some ammunition. <laughs> oh my God, I spend so much time arguing with people in my head. Um, <laughs> I, I rarely win those arguments is the, <laughs> the really surprising thing. Um, I mean, of course, yeah. I think I think the issue that comes up there is that there are that there's a lot of sometimes attention paid to the discrimination that white women face because white women have more of a voice than people of color in the office often or other marginalized work, workers. So it can feel like all the air in the room is taken up. I mean, if you just look, all you have to do is look at the data. The data is the ammunition. I mean, look at the pay gap. Look at, I mean, I, I mean the the pay gap proves all of these points, right? Women writ large make about 80 cents on the dollar. Black women make 63 cents on the dollar. That is a huge pay gap between black women and white women. Latina women make 55 cents on the dollar. The pay gap between Latina women and, and like all women is larger than between all women and men. So obviously there are, I, I feel like it's important to understand that the discrimination that like I face as a white woman is real, but it's also like, I have to recognize that I'm quite privileged on a lot of fronts in there. I have enormous blind spots and there's discrimination that I don't face at all and a lot of privilege that I have because of that. So I think, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to, to recognize that and it's, you know, it's in the data, it's in the numbers, um, but it is, I mean, white women do get discriminated against, white men get discriminated against, like there is discrimination uh, enough to go around. Um, but certainly, you know, gender is a gender in the workplace is a big one. There are numbers are there. There's a great question here um, from Yin. What advice do you have to women as they rise to the top? What should be their approach to subordinate women so that they aren't perpetuating the cycle of a system that was originally set up by men? It, it was troubling to me that it was necessary for you to dedicate a whole chapter in the book about how women who are in the upper echelons of management might not be able to mentor you or might not even want to mentor you or might be actively trying to make sure you don't get to where they are. Um, talk a little bit about what Yin's trying to get at. How do women who succeed make sure they don't perpetuate this going forward? 
Yeah, this is tricky. I didn't, wasn't even going to include that chapter, but everyone I spoke with kept bringing it up. Are you going to talk about how women don't really always support other women? Are you going to talk about how women are sometimes obstacles to other women? So I included it and there's a, this is very annoying, but the research refers to this as the queen bee syndrome. It's hard for me to say that. Um, but, but basically it, it's a result of discrimination. So if there's this feeling of tokenism uh, where it's like, okay, well, there could be like one woman in management, but that's it. We don't want to go crazy. Not two. <laughs> exactly. We just, you know, uh, we'll take care of the optics and then we'll move forward. And so what happens is if you are a woman in a, you know, a management position, if you are like the one, it becomes a like any younger woman becomes a threat. She's cheaper. She's like better at Slack. She's, you know, um, more dynamic and all this stuff. So it because basically that's like where this comes from. It's people looking at the situation and being like, I don't really have to compete with all the people in the office. I just have to compete with the women because this is really about like, there's one spot for a woman and I'm in the spot and I've got to defend my turf. Um, and also, and I've definitely experienced this a little bit. This is not my favorite thing about myself, but there is sometimes a feeling of like, well, I had to do this. You should have to do this. And I have caught myself thinking that a lot. And then I'm like, wait, should I have had to pay dues like that? And like, it, it's a, it can be very complicated. And I feel like this tends to, there's a big conversation, a generational conversation between women that can get really difficult of, um, as I think we saw a lot of this around Me Too. Yep. Um, certainly at NPR, this was a big issue, you know, where like a lot of women who had really broken a ton of ground, some of the first, you know, female voices on the air, first women, female producers, first women in media period were basically like, this is like, why are you making such a big deal about this? Just yep. deal with it. And a lot of the very young women coming in felt like they were like, I shouldn't have to deal with this treatment. Um, I'm sort of in the middle <laughs> um, and I sort of saw both. So I, I do think that's another situation too, where uh, if you go sometimes to like female mentors, they, they can sometimes give advice. And this happens, I think a lot that just feels sort of victim blamey or like too harsh or just, it just doesn't sit right. And I think, you know, a lot of it's born of people who have dealt with really terrible experiences. Um, and I try to check myself. Um, I think the best thing to do is, you know, tr just try to like, th to, to think about the situation people are, are coming from and to understand that like situations change. And like the fact I jumped through eight flaming hoops doesn't mean everyone else should jump through eight flaming hoops. Um, and in fact, it's probably better if they don't. Um, have to jump through eight flaming hoops. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think just to watch that, and I think developing relationships, mentoring people, being mentored by people, you can just learn so much. Talk like having open conversations with people, and even just being honest about those things. Be like, yeah, you know, I had to deal with X, Y, Z, but I don't know. If, I don't know if I should have had to deal with that. And just being as open, I think, and honest with other people as possible is helpful. Yeah. Karen wants to know, um, Karen is curious if you could offer any advice from your reporting and research for the book that might help women entrepreneurs seeking funding since less than 10% of available capital goes to women owned or run businesses. Yeah, 2% of venture capital. And the number went down somehow in 2020, even though way more women are starting businesses. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I got some great advice. There was a, a scientist, Vivian Ming, who has a startup um, and talked to me a little bit about raising money, Soko Slabs. And what Vivian said was the first time out raising money was just incredibly hard. And um, she had to push and push and push and push. Uh, she said after that, it got much easier because she could prove she had like a little bit of a track record. And she said it became exponentially easier. But the first time out was really hard. Um, I heard this from a lot of people. I spoke with this woman, Lisa Galopter, for, for the book. She's um, she was one of the inventors of the the GIF, the GIF I don't, of that technology. Uh, she's worked in Silicon Valley forever. She has an amazing track record, and she had this startup. She got accepted to Y Combinator, which is this very prestigious startup incubator. She just couldn't raise 
the money that her like male colleagues raised. And she said, um, Lisa is, is a black woman. And she was like, I didn't know what was going on. Is it that I was a woman? Is that it was, I was black? That it, was I not pitching it well? Was it not a good idea? And she said she was at um, a meeting with, or like a meetup, like a professional meetup. And she said there was a young man from Stanford there. And he was talking about he and his roommate were like looking to disrupt an industry. They didn't know quite what business they wanted to start, but they knew this, they knew this industry they wanted to disrupt. And they made, raised like $2 million in a week. Just, just like that. Like, just like that. Um, I think just to recognize that it's harder is a big one. I think find, there are certain angel investors. I One in the book is Frida K. Poor Klein. She focuses and makes a point of um, investing in, in women and minority owned businesses. She says it's like, it's just like a really good deal because those entrepreneurs, she said, are tend to be more prepared. They have better business plans, better credentials. Um, and I think make that point also right now, there's so much venture capital around. There's so much money sloshing around. I think if you can make the point that places maybe should think about diversity um, and that you offer that along with a really excellent business plan, that might help because I do think people do care about this stuff. And I, I think 90% of this happens unintentionally. Um, I've never started a business, but from what I understand, like raising money as a woman is just, it's really hard. Um, there was a story that I, I didn't include in the book, but I almost did. There were two women who started a business and they, in, they made up a male colleague. They just, made up an email address from a man and I think they ended up like raising money part like they just made him up they just made up a fake man and would send emails from this fake man and apparently the responses were better so you can get that's crazy. all it took it was yes it was like a, it was a really delightful story but I, I just ran out of room <laughs> um Godfrey wants to know uh, Godfrey, I love your focus on the long game and avoiding the short-term opportunity to express our anger. What tools can you suggest to use in the heat of the moment other than counting to 10? Oh man. Well, yeah, that's the trick, isn't it? Um, one thing that, so I think it's personal. Uh, one thing that Dr. Tina Opie, uh, who's a professor of management with Babson College, said what she does is she just waits for the, I was talking with her about getting interrupted or having an idea stolen in the meeting. Um, and she said she would just wait for the heat to pass, the wave of heat to pass. And I loved that term. It's just like, you just, you kind of let the emotion, you just feel it, you know, you just feel it. And a little silence, it's a very powerful thing. So I think you can just take a minute to not feel something. I mean. The nice thing about Zoom is like, you just pretend like your Wi-Fi went out. You know, you just, just pretend like your Wi-Fi went out. Uh, I mean, for me, like sometimes I just need a break. Like it's hard for me to, if I get, you know, you start to feel your emotions. I mean, it's just human, right? I mean, we're not, you know, getting control over your emotions. It sounds so easy and it's often not. Um, so, you know, I think just give yourself some space, give yourself the space you need is, is my best advice in the moment. Um, I think one of the things that I sort of defaulted to in the negotiation section of my book is if things aren't going well and you just need a minute, that just tends to be something my own style is I just, I'd like to have some time to think about things and I get, um, very stressed out if I feel like I can't take that space. So I'm just like, okay, well, this is interesting. This is giving me a lot to think about. Um, can we pick this up tomorrow? Or you can even just be like, yeah, you know, I, I can feel myself getting a little uh, emotional here, uh, but I'd love to take, I'd love to take the night and think about it. You're making some really interesting points, but can we talk again tomorrow? Yeah. Recognizing when it's not the best time for you to respond is one of the other issues you were talking about in the book. Especially um, now. We've all been under so much, I mean, we're all struggling so much, I think, in, in all kinds of ways. So just to like be as kind to yourself as you can. Yeah. Um, Allie says, sometimes women have been hired because they are considered attractive and there is a lawsuit based on that now. How common is that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know is the 
answer. I don't know how common that is. I know that like women getting judged and or treated differently because of their looks is very common. Um, it's just, you know, sort of one of the ways uh, that, that harassment often manifests itself by objectification uh, in very, takes various forms. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's probably, it's probably one of the larger ones. It's just, it's a, it's a fast and easy, it's a fast and easy discrimination. It's yeah. like bargain basement gender discrimination. You know, it's, it's the, it's the easy target is to be like, oh, as Dr. Stephanie K. Johnson put it, she's like, oh, you're, you know, whatever you think you're doing all this work, but really you're just a hot piece of, I don't know, I don't want to say it at the end of the day. Um, this is public radio. I want to be mindful, but anyway, but yeah, you're just sort of like a hot piece of tushy at the end of the day. You're not really a worker. You're not really a person of substance. So. Uh, Rima wants to know, is there an interview or a story you did tell us about one story or any other pieces of advice that didn't make it into the book that you wish that did? Oh yeah. Yeah, there were a bunch. Um, I think there was one story that I, that I really loved about, um, a woman who worked in Silicon Valley and she said they had, she and her female coworkers had developed this whole strategy to try to get their ideas heard where they would like tag team to talk to their male manager and make him think that he'd had the idea. And I was just like, I remember talking to her and being like, well, why didn't, why did you do all of that work? Because then he would support the idea. He would present the ideas as his own, everyone would be like, that's amazing. And the idea would happen. And she said, um, well, we just wanted the good idea to go forward. Like we were just so tired of watching like, you know, bad thing, you know, or like mismanagement or, or things happen in a less optimal way. <laughs> it's just like, um, I wrote that up and I kept moving it around the book uh, because it was such a powerful example of like, like what a, an amazing dedicated worker she was, but also like how hard that situation is. It's like, it gets to the point where you're basically plotting with other people how to make someone steal an idea from you uh, without understanding that that's what's happening. It's amazing. That was Mach amazing. Machiavellian? I mean, you know, it's if, if you want to see the idea go forward, you remove your, yeah, I would say yeah. it might be, yeah. I mean, although then you don't get credit for the idea that that makes me kind right. of he, he wouldn't be down with that. I think he, he might want. have a hard time with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Last question to wrap up. Um, will you tell us what is on the post-it notes behind you? Oh, yes. So this is my calendar for work. <laughs> um, so I have like dollar stores. These are story ideas, you know, so I get yeah. ideas now and everything's virtual. I have all these virtual calendars, but my calendar is synced with NPR's calendar. So I get alerts every 10 minutes for like a brown bag about, you know, finding sources in education. And so I can't even use my calendar. So I just put a calendar up there. And then during the day, I like write things down like dollar stores, because I think in 2020, the most like dollar stores were the most common store to open in the country. And then like prices up down is to look at uh, inflation and prices that have gone up or down the most for certain things. So yeah, this is my, it's a, like an externalization of my chaotic brain is how I would say sum that up. Well, Stacy, <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Thank you for writing the book, um, much needed and um, really important and useful stuff in there that women can take a lot out of and it's important now more than ever because it is the workers market these days so thank you so much again and uh Rima is going to join us again now thank you so much Des thank you so much Stacy um I I just have actually general manager prerogative can I ask you one last question Stacy yeah Fire away. Um, well, since you are on the indicator and Planet Money, any insight on what the economy is going to be doing? Oh, I know. I mean, it's. I feel like we're like a 
an important kind of moment. Um, yeah. <laughs> it seems like, you know, inflate the inflation issue does worries me. You know, we don't want to see our economy get too overheated. Um, and inflation can be, we haven't had like spiraling inflation for a really long time. Right. Uh, and so far it hasn't been so, but so out of control, but the way that it is now, most workers have actually lost money, even though most workers have gotten a 5.4 or like, I think people who've jumped jobs have gotten a 5.4% raise inflation's past 6%. So most people have actually, our earnings are worth less. So we've actually got an anti-raise which concerns me. So we have less spending power. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of it'll depend on what, hap what happens with COVID. Right. Uh, right. If, you know, everyone's suddenly saying fifth, there's a fifth wave coming. I think that could be really devastating. We're going into winter. I mean, you know, it's very, it makes it really hard for businesses like restaurants to, to operate. I don't, no, I think there's so much uncertainty. The supply chain issues seem pretty serious. I'm worried, I guess I would say. I am mm -hmm. optimistic. I, I am optimistic. I try to be, um, I, yeah, I am optimistic. I think if, as long as we, I think the next probably six months are going to be really critical. Well, Stacy, thank you. Um, and <laughs> we're going to invite you back because this has been absolutely a phenomenal conversation. And we'd love to talk more about even women and money the, the, the next time we have you back, just because we'd love to follow up on the great, you know, resignation and it's really affecting women and especially women of color. Um, but thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. This has been such a delightful and insightful join the conversation. Thank you very much to um, the Fairfield Public Library who has been a lovely community partner and a long community partner of WSHU Public Radio. We will be having our next join the conversation um, in the winter months, probably around January, February. So stay tuned. And thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. And to close out, just close your browser. <laughs>